Just like the previous videos in this series on applied anatomy, this video is a very quick revision of the histology that you've already learnt in previous years. I will be going very very quickly through everything, but take note that everything I say or write here is important for you to know. The pace of the video is fast and you will almost certainly have to pause the video and rewind in order to catch up or close your eyes and listen to what I am saying about something so as not to get distracted by my writing on screen. Even though this video falls under the section on the reproductive tract of the cow, the histology that I am going to discuss here applies to all of our domestic species. Where there are important species differences, I am going to point these out to you. The vulva and the vestibulum are the point at which the internal reproductive tract joins the external environment. They are developed from the embryonic urogenital sinus. Just like the penis, the clitoris contains erectile tissue, but the presence of a clitoral corpus spongiosum is a topic of some uncertainty. There is a mucocutaneous junction at the labia, where the stratified squamous epithelium of the vulva joins the skin. The skin is tough and well keratinized, and doesn't allow very much water to pass through it. The mucous membrane of the vulva, on the other hand, is much more permeable to water, and remains moist. The wall of the vagina has three layers, the mucosa, the muscularis, and the serosa. The mucosa consists of layers of squamous epithelial cells. The cow is a little different. She has stratified columnar cells in the cranial vagina, with mucus secreting goblet cells amongst them, but she still has squamous epithelial cells in the caudal vagina. In bitches and queens, the stage of the oestrus cycle has got a significant effect on the thickness and the turnover rate of the cells that form the mucosa. This can be used to tell very accurately where a bitch is in her oestrus cycle. You will study this in much more detail when you cover reproduction in dogs. Beneath the mucosa, there is a region known as the lamina propria, which serves as a bed for the squamous epithelium of the mucosa. The lamina propria has many elastic collagen fibers which help give the vagina its stretchy properties. The next layer is the muscularis. The muscularis consists of an inner circular and an outer longitudinal layer. The muscularis layer is not nearly as well defined in the vagina as it is in the uterus. The vaginal serosa, which is also known as the adventitia, consists of mesothelial cells on loose areolar connective tissue. It allows the vagina to move against other pelvic organs without adhering to them. The cervix of the cow has a mucosa with a tall columnar epithelium and goblet cells that secrete mucus. The composition of this mucus is dependent on circulating hormones. As you saw in the video on the gross anatomy of the cervix and uterus, diestrus causes the secretion of a thick yellow mucus plug, while oestrus induces secretion of a less viscous clearer mucus. The lamina propria of the cervix is formed of dense connective tissue, particularly in cows and in sheep. The inner circular and outer longitudinal layer of the muscularis are present as they are in the vagina. In the cow, the smooth muscle of the muscularis is relatively insignificant compared to the dense connective tissue that forms the lamina propria. The mare's cervix, on the other hand, comprises mostly smooth muscle. In the ewe, there are many cervical crypts that may have secondary or even tertiary folds. These act as sites of sperm storage after mating. From innermost to outermost, the uterus comprises the endometrium, the myometrium, and the perimetrium. The perimetrium is also known as the serosa. Let's take a closer look at the endometrium, since there's usually quite a lot going on there. The endometrium of the cow consists of a lamina propria in which are embedded uterine glands. The lamina propria is richly supplied with blood vessels. The uterine glands that sit in the lamina propria are coiled in the cow and the mare, but in carnivores they are straight. In cows, the regions that form the caruncles are non-glandular. 
The muscularis, or the myometrium, just like in the vagina, has an inner circular and an outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle. The uterus is supplied with blood by vessels that run in a layer called the stratum vasculare. In the cow, this stratum vasculare divides the circular muscle layer into two sublayers. The perimetrium is the outermost layer and is continuous with the broad ligament. The perimetrium consists of layers of simple squamous epithelium called mesothelium on top of loose areolar connective tissue. There are many blood vessels, nerves and lymphatics in the perimetrium. We haven't dealt very much yet with uterine tubes in previous videos, except very briefly when we covered the gross anatomy of the uterus. The uterine tubes are also known as the fallopian tubes. Some texts refer to them as oviducts. In my opinion, this is incorrect since oviducts are structures that oviparous species like birds and reptiles have. There are three main segments of the uterine tubes, the infundibulum, the ampulla, and the isthmus. The infundibulum is shaped like a funnel and has finger-like projections called fimbriae which it uses to pick up the oocyte at ovulation. The ampulla is the site of fertilization and is where the zygote is formed. The isthmus moves the developing embryo towards the uterus after fertilization. There are ciliated columnar epithelial cells throughout the uterine tubes as well as smooth muscle. During estrus, the fimbria become engorged due to increased blood flow and smooth muscle contractions cause them to move over the surface of the ovary to pick up the ovulated oocyte. In the cow, smooth muscle contractions of the uterine tube and ciliary movements during estrus cause sperm to reach the ampulla within five minutes of mating. During diestrus, the direction of movement of smooth muscle contraction of ciliary sweepings is reversed. The zygote is then moved towards the uterus. It takes four to five days for the zygote to move through the isthmus and to reach the uterus. The ovary is divided into the cortex and the medulla. The ovarian cortex is outermost, while the medulla is innermost. In the mare, the cortex and medulla are reversed, so that the cortical tissue lies inside. Not only does the ovary produce oocytes for fertilization by sperm, but it is also endochronologically active, producing hormones that regulate the reproductive cycle. The ovarian cortex is covered by a thick connective tissue layer called the tunica albuginea. On top of the tunica albuginea is a cuboidal surface epithelium. The cortex contains the ovarian follicles at various stages of development, as well as corpora lutea, all of which are embedded in a loose connective tissue. An ovarian follicle is formed from the oocyte itself. It is formed from a variety of cells, some of which are endochronologically active and others are not. Female animals are born with a finite number of primordial follicles. Very few of these will actually develop into oocytes that will ovulate. The remainder will never develop at all, or if they do develop, they will degenerate in a process known as follicular atresia. Primordial follicles consist of a primary oocyte, which has not undergone meiosis II, surrounded by a simple squamous epithelium of follicular cells. In ruminants, the primordial follicles are evenly distributed around the outer portion of the ovarian cortex, while in carnivores they occur in clusters. The next phase of growth of follicles are the primary follicles. The primary oocyte enlarges and becomes surrounded by a cuboidal epithelium. Not all primary follicles will develop into secondary follicles. Secondary follicles are also known as preantral follicles. They are formed of a primary oocyte surrounded by a stratified epithelium of special follicular cells known as granulosa cells. Secondary follicles will start to develop a zona pellucida, which is a glycoprotein layer around the plasma membrane of the oocyte. The theca cells start to form around the granulosa cells in the late secondary follicle stage. The next type and the final type are tertiary follicles. They are also known as Gravian follicles after the 17th century Dutch anatomist Rainier de Graaf. Tertiary follicles are formed of a primary oocyte, which in most species undergoes meiosis II to form a secondary oocyte just prior to ovulation. Surrounding this are a stratified epithelium of endochronologically active granulosa cells, which are in turn surrounded by a layer of cells called the theca. 
a fluid filled cavity called the follicular antrum develops. Initially, follicular fluid fills up spaces between the granulosa cells, but then it forms a distinct cavity around which lie these cells. At ovulation, meiosis II occurs, forming secondary oocytes. One of these resulting cells will be the fertilizable oocyte, but the remaining daughter cells are called polar bodies and will not be fertilizable under normal circumstances. The bitch is unusual among our domestic species in that she ovulates a primary oocyte that has not yet undergone meiosis II. This only happens after ovulation. The follicle breaks open and releases the oocyte which is picked up by the fimbriae. The space where the follicular antrum used to be fills up with blood and is known as a corpus hemorrhagicum. The granulosa cells and the theca cells undergo hyperplasia and change into different cell types. The granulosa cells become large luteal cells and the theca cells become small luteal cells. These two cell types are quite important so remember them for later. Sometimes the corpus luteum may have a fluid filled cavity in the middle. This is completely normal and must be differentiated from a cystic corpus luteum. If there is no pregnancy, the corpus luteum regresses and is replaced by a corpus albicans. The endochronologically active large and the small luteal cells are replaced by collagenous scar tissue.